3, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we are taking a small break uh, just this morning, break from Judges, uh, just Memorial Day uh, tomorrow and celebrating this weekend and our time together as a church. Uh, in April of 1863, in a small town called Columbus, Mississippi, after decorating the graves of her two sons who died representing their beloved South, an elderly woman with two mounds of dirt at the corner of the cemetery placed memorial flowers there as well. Another lady shouted, What are you doing? Those are the graves of two Union soldiers. Softly and with compassionate and compassion, the mother said, I know. I also know that somewhere in the north, a mother or a young wife mourns for these two just as much as we do our lost ones. That, mo that loving deed set in motion the celebration of Memorial Day. And ever since then, it's been known as Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a time that we as a country set aside to remember those who have sacrificed for their country. It is not a day for me. My day is in November. It's a veteran. That's my day. Memorial Day is not for men and women on active duty. That's what Armed Forces Day is for. Today is a day for for people who didn't come home. Sorry, I was, <laughs> names were flooding my head. Been like First Lieutenant David Wright from Norman, Oklahoma. Sergeant Andrew McConnell. Staff Sergeant Juan Gutierrez. It's not about me. I got to come home. I might have come home a little bit crazier than I left, but I got to come home. Today, I believe it would be helpful for us to honor the memory of all those who have sacrificed their lives on the altar of freedom, especially in a time where the altar of freedom is growing increasingly more difficult to see. Thousands have sacrificed their lives, and we need to remember that it was not in vain. We need to live our lives in such a way that their sacrifice is not in vain. Because of their sacrifice, we are free today. Because of their sacrifice, we have the right to assemble together and worship God. Because of their sacrifice, we live in a country that allows us to choose to be whatever we want. I said a country, not God. Allows us to choose to be whatever we want to be, even when God says not. Because of these sacrifices, we have the freedom to sit there and complain and, and gripe about everything we don't like and yet just sit there comfortably in our recliners and not do a stinking thing about it. Because of these sacrifices, we can openly and unapologetically worship God. I want to share some numbers with you. Revolutionary War. There's a casualty list from all our wars. Revolutionary War, 25,324. Civil War, 498,332. World War I, 116,710. World War II, 407,316. Korean War, 54,546. Vietnam, 58,098. The First Gulf War, 
293. Global War on Terror, 7,238. Of which I know, of which memorial services I've had to go to, my war. My desire today is not to diminish the sacrifice and the service of the men and women who have served our nation faithfully, faithfully and valiantly. And I believe every one of you here knows me well enough to know my blood is not red, it's red, white, and blue. I am as patriotic as they get. I remember being a, about a, let's see, I would have been 13, 14, I'm trying to think, 13. I remember during the first Gulf War, I was 14. I remember my dad was in the Air Force. And um, he was part of the Honor Guard. So when people would come back from the first, full, first Gulf War, they would have the Honor Guard come out and do the various ceremonies. And I remember one time, raining. And it was a service member who had lost their life in the first Gulf War. And we were out there watching there for the ceremony, this person returning home. And, and I remember my parents saying, telling me that they thought it would be good for me to see firsthand the sacrifice and just experience that. So we went to the homecoming for this fallen service member. My dad being in the honor guard, was out there. I don't remember exactly, but if my memory serves me right, the plane got delayed two hours because of weather, and I stood there as a 14-year-old kid watching my dad stand at perfect attention, waiting for that fallen service member to come home with the plane that had been delayed two hours, like a statue. And I, want, I wanted that to be me. I wanted to do it. I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be the one. I, I, there was something inside me that I desired to be the one willing to stand there. The one willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to run away from the gun, gunshots. I'm going to go towards them. There was something within me that said, you know what? These people are coming home in flag draped coffins. Who's going to pick up the torch? I remember it like it was yesterday. So, my desire today is not to take away from our service members, but I want to talk about someone. A specific person. I want to share some things about someone who laid it all on the line. Not for politics, not for preferences, not for rights, not for freedoms, not for a country but to restore mankind's relationship to God. You see, for Christians, every day is Memorial Day. We need to remember the sacrifice of heaven's greatest soldier. So I want us to remember today a man named Jesus the sacrifice that he has made for us. Look with me, if you would, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read one verse. One verse. Paul is writing to Timothy, a young preacher boy, outlines to him the uh, requirements 
and qualifications for a pastor and a deacon. And then he says in verse 14, These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Do you see that, church? As the church, we are the pillar and ground of of truth. If we're not taking a stand, if we're not standing in the gap, if we're not saying, thus saith the Lord God, how can we be a pillar? Pillar holding up, supporting truth. How can we be grounded? How can we be the ground of truth? The, the place where people could come to hear truth. That's who we are as a church. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God. Jesus is so much more than the Son of God. He is God. The greatest soldier heaven ever sent. So the title of the message today, and we'll open in a word of prayer, but the title of the message today is Every Day is Memorial Day. Father, we come before you this morning asking you to open our hearts and our ears for the message. Father, I ask that you would do a work in our hearts that is very special. Father, help us to not forget nor neglect to be appreciative and grateful and thankful for the men and women who have laid their lives on the altar of freedom. But, Father, help us to more so to not neglect the sacrifice that your precious son made when he laid his life upon the altar of sacrifice. Father, help us to be renewed, re-energized, reinvigorated, Father, revive our hearts, stir something within us that is uncontrollable, motivating, and eternal. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need you to cleanse me of sin. Lord, I need you to empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit. Lord, we'll be sure to give you the honor the glory and the praise, because we know that you will use your word. Father, help us to continue to be a light in the dark darkness, shining brightly for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think the verse before us today was likely a, a hymn of the early church. In its six short stanzas, it tells us all about the gospel. It tells us all about grace, doesn't it? So I want to Look at this brief but powerful song. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. The phrase, God was manifest in the flesh, I think is pretty self-explanatory. It reminds us, doesn't it? of one of the greatest events in human history. It reminds us of the moment where God Almighty, Creator, stepped out of eternity into the world. What we call the Incarnation. Where a holy, sovereign God stepped out of glory to be born of a virgin 
to live the life that you and I were unable to live for the purposes of dying for you and I so that we might live forever with the Father. So for the sole purpose of restoring our relationship with the Lord, with God the Father. Think about this. Jesus laid aside his heavenly address. Think about this. Today is really practical. I, it's nothing fancy. I just want us to just think very practically this morning. When you join the military, <laughs> and we'll tell you, when you join the military, you, man, I, I'd never been on an airplane. Here it is. I'm 19 years old, moving off, moving away from home. I get taken over to the airport in Oklahoma City and hop on an airplane and they fly me up to Chicago. I remember I went in the Navy first, so boot camps in Chicago. Get to Chicago and you go over to the USO and it's a special place where you get a whole bunch of free stuff. And now I know why they give you a whole bunch of free. Now I still go over there because I can get free coffee. But, but I didn't know this stuff then, so... Now I, I, but then I was like, wow, they're really taking care of us. They're not taking care of us. They're softening you up. So you're there and you're congregating. And you just see in this room all these 18, 19 year olds going off to do something that only 3% of the United States is even qualified to do. 3%. You are one of 3% of the entire country qualified to sit in that room. We're sitting there and we have our coffee and our snacks and it's amazing. It's late. It's about 10 o'clock at night. They take you downstairs to the baggage claim area. Tell you to go get on these buses. What they don't tell you is what's waiting on the buses. Now, I have family who is military, so I had heard the stories. But you go and you climb on these buses, and that's it. Your life is never the same. You get on the bus, and everybody's like, come on in. Let's go. Come on, hurry up. We got we to gotta drive. We got to get there. We need to go all the way to the back, you know. Come on, let's go. Fill it up. Rear to front. Come on, let's go. When that door shuts and that bus driver puts that bus in drive, there's something that happens when the wheels of that bus begin to turn. There's something that happens and something that begins to turn in the brain of that person on that bus. And they're not being nice anymore. Now you're getting yelled at. Remember that, Brother Dale? Just spazzing out. On the bus. You don't, <laughs> I remember going, yeah, I should go home. I was a, a high school athlete. I'd been yelled at, and I mean, it, it wasn't that. It was just, what did I get myself into? They drive around. It's an hour drive from the airport to boot camp, but they drive around for like two hours, so you get lost, so you can't, if you do, try to take off and escape. You don't know where to go. So they drive you around Chicago for two hours, North Chicago, and they pull in. And you think the guy on the bus was bad. Now there's a guy standing there with this funny little hat on. And I remember, so it's a little bit different in the Navy, but they all do the same thing. So I remember they're called RDCs in the Navy, but I'll call them drill sergeants just because that's what people recognize. My drill sergeant was this big. He told me to stop getting off the bus and turn around. And he stepped up two steps to look me in the eye. I laughed. Didn't work out so well. Pastor, where are you going? Everything changed. But you want to know what changed that, that I didn't even think about? My address. I never lived at home again. I went to do, listen to me, I went to do a specific job like every other service member does. They go to do a specific job 
And that job is to be willing, ready, willing, and able to put their life on the line for other people. And the first thing that changed was my address, my home. It was no different for Jesus. He left willing, able, and ready to lay his life on the line for other people. He didn't even have home anymore. His new home was different. It wasn't the glorious presence of the Father. It was here. He, he left to, to come and be where we were. He laid aside all of the benefits and blessings that come with being the Son of God. He laid aside his, his apparel, his, his, what you saw, what he wore. He was, we're talking about a man that was robed in righteousness. He wears, he wore righteousness, perfection, and, and holiness, and, and he's robed in it, wrapped in it, covered in it. To come to this earth and put on what? This flesh. He gave it up. No different. Our soldiers now do the same thing. You don't wear the same clothes. You're different. You got to look different. They give you uniforms. They give you structure. There's all these weird things on your arm that tells you who you have to listen to and who you can tell to feel like. Then all the weird stuff on this right here on your arm goes away and they start putting it up here and then it just gets more confusing. And if they have stuff up here and not right here, you just listen to the stuff up here. It's an easy way to go. It's no different. Jesus was a soldier. And I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm not trying to downplay it. I think you understand that. I want us to, let me, it's Memorial Day. And if we're going to celebrate Memorial, Memorial Day, let's make every day Memorial Day. But let's make every day Memorial Day remembering the one who laid his life on the line for all mankind. The one who left heaven to come to this world. The one who, who, who knew pain and learned what, what suffering was and experienced rejection and hunger and thirst and loneliness. Who experienced and went through the, the heartache and the frustration and the problems that, that are all part of the, what we call the human condition. He suffered all that he suffered. So that he might feel our pain, so he could comfort us when we experience that pain. The one who is in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Lord, what are you doing? I'm putting you in a position to re rely on me and rest in me. Trust in me. Look, if we are in Christ, and Christ lived on this earth sinless, and we are in Christ, do we or do we not have the ability in Christ to live a sinless life? We're not going to arrive in this life, but we have the ability. Those old things are passed away. All things have become new. We didn't have hope before Jesus. We didn't have salvation before Jesus. We didn't have deliverance. We had nothing to look forward to, not peace, not joy. We had nothing to look forward to. All that we had was temporary emotional responses to whatever was going on in our life. But what Jesus provides is the ability to overcome, the ability to endure. He doesn't even require us to do the work. He does the work for us. We just have to get out of the stinking way. Jesus isn't a, didn't come to do it for us. To, 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 he came to do it in us. He 
And by doing it in us, He does it for us. Look, this is, there's something we need to understand. When we talk about, about soldiers, there's an element that we need to understand, and, and that is this. There is a relational aspect that you cannot understand if you've never put the uniform on and fox, uh, hopped in a foxhole. You cannot understand that relational element. When, 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 the, when the fight is going on, it's not about the politics. It's not, you don't think about any of that stuff. You're not thinking about back home. You're in the fight. You are not focused on any of the politics. You're thinking about what you have to do to make sure the guy next to you gets home. He's sitting there thinking about what he's got to do to get you home because you're the guy on his side. There is a relational aspect, and Christ took that same relational element when he left the Father, when he left heaven and humbled himself and came down to live this life. He did it. He was not thinking about, about his glory and what he left behind and not thinking about what was to come. And He knew what was to come. He knew what he was here for, but he didn't think about that stuff. He wasn't thinking about home. He wasn't thinking about what was tomorrow. He came thinking and understanding right now today, I need to save those around me. He was focused on the fight, committed. And the struggle was that because he looked at somebody else, some people didn't believe. I would argue that even though he looked like everybody else, there's people who today just don't believe who he is. Make no mistakes about it. Jesus came to this world as a man. He lived his life as a man. He died on the cross as a man. He rose again from, as a man. He ascended back to the right hand of the Father where He sits today as a man. And when He comes again, He will return as a man. He willingly and eternally laid aside His omnipresence. Limited Himself to a human body for all of eternity, because He loves us. Pastor, He has a human body. Yep, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. He had a body. A body walked out of the grave, walked out of the tomb, okay? Walked out. He didn't just vaporize. The stone was rolled away. Why? Because He had a body. Jesus didn't just like, it's through the rock. Okay? Well, how do you know it was a rock, Pastor? It was a stone. That means it's a really big rock. He didn't just walk through it. No, no, no. The angel of the Lord came and rolled it out the way so Jesus could walk up out of there. He was witnessed by 500 in 40 days. 500 people saw him walking, talking, moving about. Physical form. He wasn't a hologram. It wasn't a. Uh, there wasn't a vision. He he wasn't transparent. He wasn't see through. You could touch him. He went to Thomas and he said, "Hey, knucklehead, it's me. Look at my feet. Look at my hands. Look. You can put your finger in there, but you can't touch me because you're unclean. I'm holy." We can put our fingers in the holes of his hand. You can't do that. He doesn't have a body. Jesus ascended to the Father. He didn't just vaporize. He didn't, it wasn't that Jesus was standing there and just turned into some magical vapor. No. He ascended. You know what that means? Jesus is standing, and he goes, out of sight. Could you imagine? Whew. The, the weight of that thought just kind of hit me. Like, I'd be frozen. Just. 
dumbfounded. You know how many people are going to be sitting there going, when he comes back? Because he's going to come back. He's going to put his feet down right back on this rock that he created, by the way, and say, my turn. Now it's my way. Look, he has a body. Pastor, why do you talk so much about Jesus' body? Because I want you to understand there's nothing in this world that you cannot overcome in the power of Christ because he's been there. He's done it. He's lived it. He's been tempted. Jesus was tempted? Yeah. Ah, he was in all points tempted like as we are. He knows what you're going through. He's experienced the temptation. He knows the struggle. He knows the agony. He knows the frustration. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be hungry, thirsty, hurt, injured, sleepy. He gets it. But he did it without sin. He did. He lived the life without sin, that you and I cannot live without sin. He lived it without sin. We can't live it without sin. Why? Why would he do that? So that you could live that life. So that you could be deemed righteous in the eyes of God. So you could have the opportunity to stand before a holy God and say, in Jesus, I'm worthy. Because his blood has been placed upon my account, I can call you Father. Because he shed his blood, he sacrificed, laid down his life for me, I am able to live for all eternity. what soldiers do and make sacrifices for the sole point of affording others the opportunity to live Isn't that something what an amazing thought Paul says he was justified in the spirit seen of angels preached on the Gentiles believed on the world believed on in the world Paul's telling us about the earthly ministry of Jesus. Look, he wasn't just God who showed up with a body and was here. No, 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 no. He served. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels. Speaking of a time that Jesus was baptized in Jordan, began his earthly ministry, the power of the Holy Ghost was upon him. Jesus did all he did not as God, but as a spirit-filled man. To show us and set the example for us that, that we too can accomplish all that God wants us to accomplish if we're spirit-filled. Not spirit-filled like craziness. Spirit-filled letting the Holy Spirit of God have control. Letting the words of our mouth and the meditations of our Eyes be acceptable in his sight. We talk about being seen of angels. Think about his birth. Suddenly, there was with the shepherds. Oh, heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God, peace, good will. Matthew account when they saw the star they rejoiced with exceeding great joy there was evidence there was things going on then the angel appears unto the shepherds and says hey you're out of a job And we've talked about and I've taught and explained who those shepherds were and the sheep that they were overseeing. What about when he was tempted? Matthew chapter 4. What about when he was tempted by Satan? Angels 
who spoke to the woman at the empty tomb. What about them? What about those who watched as their creator was born? The angels lived among men and fulfilled the plan of God. They watched with their hands on the hills, uh, hilts of their swords as he died, waiting for orders to come and fight for him. Orders that the angels would never get. He was seen of angels. God sent his messengers to verify and validate as another supporting document, if you will. What more proof do we need? What is so hard to believe? Why is it so hard to believe in this man called Jesus? Does it, you didn't see it for yourself? Because you just can't wrap your mind around it? Because you don't like what he stands for? I mean, let's just be honest, that's likely the direction you're going. Why do we, why do we try to remove Christ from everything? Why is it? Why is it that our society throws a conniption fit when you are given a military discount? Why is it that you're scoffed at when you park in the veterans' parking at Lowe's? Yes, those things happen. But then everybody gets excited. You know why you get a day off work tomorrow? Because people died so you could have that day off work. Look, all I'm saying is if we're going to be, if we're going to take a stand on this side, or we're going to take a stand on that side, that's fine. Take your stand. That's fine. But don't try to mingle the two together. Either Jesus came or he didn't. And with, with immeasurable evidence supporting that he came why in the world would you try and believe in anything else why we can't have it both ways folks we can't have our cake and eat it too you can have the cake or you can eat it you can't have it both ways You can be born again or lost. You can be saved or condemned. There is no middle ground. Wars don't work that way. There are those who die and those who live. And this is spiritual warfare, folks. Jesus is the one who came to fight for righteousness, the one who was righteous, the one who did what we couldn't do, the one who paid a debt we couldn't pay. You know what that means? That means you can't afford it because all of your righteousness is as filthy rags. What's that mean? All the things that you think are good about you are as filthy rags. Even the things that are good about you are not good. That's what it means. You had a debt you could not pay. Completely and entirely unable, unable to pay. How many of you ever had been in a situation you couldn't pay a bill? Be honest, it's okay. You could not. There's, Brother Tom, was there anything you could do? You couldn't pay? Even a little bit. Am I right? Like, a time, like even a little bit. Look, if you've ever been young and married, you've had bills you can't pay. Okay? If you've ever been part of a military family, you've had bills you can't pay. Okay. <laughs> but it, but it's you want to pay it. You want to take care of it. You know you need to take care of it. It's not that you don't want to. You can't. Am I right? You could send a dollar, but that don't pay the debt. 
You can go to church, but it don't pay your debt. Oh, here he goes. Uh -huh. You can be good. You can be nice. But you can't pay your debt. You can read your Bible. But you can't pay your debt. That's what it means. That's what God means when he said we had a debt we could not pay. Jesus settled it. How did he settle it? Because he was righteous. And our righteousness, all of the things that we think is good enough, all of those things that, that we would imagine would help us to be able to take care of our debt and pay that debt and, 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 and uh, 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 solidify our, our relationship with the Father, all of those things that seem as though, would seemingly be good enough or work or, or, or meet the qualifications and the criteria, all of those things, God says, are as filthy rags. What do you do with a filthy rag? Why? That's why we talk about being washed in the blood. Well, what is washed? Our filthy rags. So, so let me get this right, Pastor. You mean to tell me? So we're washed in the blood. Our, our filthy rags are washed. That means our good works are washed. Yeah, so now those things that you do that are, would appear to be good, now because you're doing them in the spirit of God, they count for something. Because now it's not you doing it. Now it's just being that new creature. Old things are passed away. All things will become new. Your motivation is new. You're not trying to earn it. That's why we don't preach fire insurance around here. Look, it's not about avoiding hell. It's about accepting God. It's about entering into a relationship. You want to believe in everything that you want to believe in. What is so hard? about accepting and trusting that Jesus came to die for you because you had a debt you could not pay. You're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You've never reached out to Him. You've never cried out to Him by faith and said, Lord, I don't know. I don't understand it all. There's things I, I know I'm a sinner and I believe that you came to save me Forgive me. That's all that has to be done. If you've never done that, you stand condemned today. You see, here's one thing about the military. While we're all willing to lay our lives on the line for one another, it sure is nice to know that somebody's willing to lay theirs down for us. So you may be that person who has a natural propensity to run into the building on fire. That might be you. That might be your personality. You might be the one that you see some horrific tragedy on TV or on the news and, and you have this genuine empathetic desire to help them. That may be you. You may be that person who wants to help. You want to save people. And that's all fine, and that's all well. But until you do it, it's just a desire. You see, Jesus didn't have a desire. He had a desire that he followed through on. He didn't want to restore us. He wanted to restore us and did something about it. That's how much he loves us. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friend. What's that tell you about Jesus? 
greatest love that we can have for one another is to lay our lives down for one another? How much does that, what does that tell you about Jesus and how much he loves you? Because he did it. I'm not taking anything away from our service members. Not. You guys know that. You know me well enough. And we have holidays like this to remember those who laid their life and gave their life for us. But we don't know how long their sacrifice is going to last. All of the freedoms that they died for could be gone tomorrow. Think about that. But the freedoms that we have in Christ are everlasting. Can't be taken away. You don't have to worry about them going anywhere. Because he has set you free. It's no longer an issue. Pastor, I still struggle. I know you do. But that's temporary. Look, battles happen. And sometimes we lose battles. But as child, as a child of God, you are guaranteed to be on the winning side because when Jesus comes back, he will win the war. We need to remember who Jesus is. He is the greatest soldier to ever live. He is the righteous who lived at a life, at, who became as though he was unrighteous. That the unrighteous could live as though they were righteous. You have to go back and watch live the video of that, or I'll mess it up. Think about it. Brother Dale makes his way to the organ. I want you to think about one last thing. Because of our sin, we are condemned. Our inability to believe, our, our unwillingness to place our faith and trust in Christ, we are condemned, right? See that, Right? That's what the Bible teaches us. There hath no condemnation. There is no condemnation, none, to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Those who have, are under the blood. But I want you to think about this. There is condemnation for those who have not trusted Christ. Now I want you to think about what Jesus said as he hung there minutes before death as he hung there on the cross. He's left his home address. He has taken on an entirely new wardrobe, speaking of human flesh. He's dealing with things that he should have never had to deal with. He's God. He had a hand in creation, and all of a sudden, temptation's an issue? Like, he's got to deal with that mess? He didn't create that. So here it is. Think about who this is. Think about what he's given up. Think about it as he, has laid, as he sits there, as he hangs there, arms stretched out, and cries, My God, my God, why hast thou turned your back on me? Why? What did I do? Think about that. Because he didn't do anything. You did. You did it. I did it. I was the one who couldn't save myself. I was the one. who was relying on being a good person. I was the one who was just doing church stuff. I was the one who was believing in some man. I was the one who was believing in some statue. I was the one who was living for me. And God turned his back on Jesus? That's a sacrifice. 
That is a price that we can't pay. He did it for us. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for everybody. And then to top it off, then to top it off, his last final words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You're sitting here today. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You know what Jesus says about it? Father, forgive them. They don't know. Look, that doesn't give you a free pass. That's just how much Jesus loves you. He doesn't hold it against you. If you don't trust in him, he doesn't hold it against you. He still loves you. And he's still waiting for you to trust him. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We want to give you an opportunity to come and